Hi, my name is Tim France, clinical application specialist for Hamilton Medical. And I'm going to present an article, um, journal article, and that looked at whether or not MCA was a reliable technique to assess excretory flow limitation. The study or the article was published in 2012. Uh, it was a French study. And it looked at whether or not MCA was comparable to NEP or negative excretory pressure um, maneuver as far as a way to, to assess excretory flow limitation. So just quickly, the definition, basically uh, inability of a patient to empty their lungs to what a normal FRC level should be. Um, some of the causes or the main causes kind of be destruction of small airways. Um, and that could be from some type of chronic disease or it could be from um, elevated esophageal pressures. Um, but and some detrimental effects to that are gonna be um, hyperinflation, um, as time goes on and the continued elevation of the FRC and then gas exchange issues, um, increasing work of breathing as the patient tries to overcome these issues. Um, uh, muscle fibers, extra muscle fibers, continual destruction. If, if they're on a the ventilator, they can have synchrony issues, uh, not being able to cycle a breath or not being able to initiate a breath. And then because of the increase in um, intrinsic auto peep, you can have cardiac compromise. So let's look at lung volumes, um, and we see on the left, and we look at TR, TLC, and that's broken down into different compartments. We have IRV and tidal volume, which are primary, um, these are the primary gas compartments where gas exchange happen. And then you have ERV and you have RV, and then which comprises your FRC. If you look at a patient who has a chronic lung disease, you can see what, what happens over time is because of uh, inability to fully exhale all the way, you have your FRC increases. Again, these are not gases that are um, that participate in gas exchange. So we have issues with uh, CO2 retention, work of breathing um, issues, um, oxygenation issues that uh, are subsequently that subsequently happen after this. Here's just another example of what happens in dynamic hyperinflation from a situation where there's inadequate emptying of the lungs. Over time, you see the DFRC increases, um, whereas tidal volume, again, and um, IRV are compartments that actually that, that decrease uh, over time. Here's a, a, a situation where we have a um, airway that is compromised and we have pleural pressures, uh, forces um, from outside the lungs uh, compressing. And so this creates extra flow limitation because a patient cannot empty their lungs adequately. So you'll have gas that will back up into the alveolar space and dilate the alveolar space. Another example of what can happen from an anatomic standpoint is, here's a situation where we have an upper airway uh, obstruction and when a patient inhales against that, they actually create a lot of negative intrathoracic pressure, which dilates um, the whole airway system. Whereas you have a patient over here who has um, uh, esophageal um, or um, esophageal pressure increase, um, or pleural pressure increase, you'll see that they're, and they have weak or damaged small airways, the compression happens here. And we get a situation where the alveoli are dilated. So this is a kind of a difference of, of what happens. Both of these could be flow limitation, but it just so have, it just depends on, on, on where it happens, intrathoracic versus extrathoracic. One, another way to assess um, or to make, assess whether or not maybe your patient has is looking at the ventilator graphics. And you can see that this patient is not, if you look at the flow waveform, they're not fully exhaling. Um, and this is because they're breathing spontaneously. You can see they're, they're probably, they're doing this on their own. And this could be from anxiety, pain, or whatever. You can also see on your CO2 capnogram that there's inadequate emptying um, as well. So what will happen is you'll have, uh, the respiratory will continue to go up, work of breathing can continue to go up. You'll have ineffective ventilation. And then um, subsequently you get flow limitation. 
So the fix for this patient was simple, um, just sedate them and you can see that um, now we have good emptying of the lungs. Um, they're, they're not triggering, so, um, so we have good emptying here. So this was an easy fix. Um, this was not something that's caused by chronic lung disease. So how do we assess it? Um, first thing we wanna do is assess, uh, look at if the patient has any intrinsic auto -peat. We can also do PFT testing if the patient can tolerate it. Um, the negative extra pressure technique, which I'll, uh, I will describe in a, in a little bit. And then um, maybe we have too much PEEP and because PEEP is a resistor. So maybe we, if we can uh, decrease the PEEP or take the patient off the ventilator to see if their lungs can empty, if they can tolerate this. Um, and then there's a, a technique called force oscillation that I had never heard of, but basically they are hooking a speaker up to the patient and delivering five Hertz and assessing whether or not they have flex free flow limitation. Um, the problem with most of these is that sometimes the patient may not be able to tolerate it. Um, maybe they can't do a PFT and I'll describe some issues with uh, NEP in a minute and force oscillation is just something that sounds very difficult to do. So the two techniques that were looked at specifically were MCA, manual compression of the abdomen. And basically the investigators gently press down on the abdomen um, throughout the expiratory phase. So after a full inspiratory relaxation, their palm of their hand, the top of their hand was on the xiphoid and the bottom of their hand was um, right above the pubic region. The negative extroid pressure technique where they had a PFT device or some type of device to measure flows or uh, tidal volumes and was connected via pneumatac. And then um, there was a negative pressure source that was inserted into the circuit. And they used about five, a negative five PSI to, um, to and they would um, do this throughout the whole expiratory phase. Here's what the setup looks like. You can see that the pneumotac um, connected uh, proximally and fed into a device to read flows and volumes. And then the um, negative external source um, was put inside the ventilator on the expiratory limb and activated throughout the extra phase, just like the MCA technique. Some methods. So the number of patients total were 44. Um, they primarily looked at the flow volume loops as, to assess whether or not they had a uh, flow limitation. For both techniques, uh, exploit flow was defined as percent of tidal volume exhaled after each maneuver was done and with no flow increase. Um, so now looking at the graphics, uh, just a couple of patients, one that was not flow limited and one that was flow limited. The graph on the left is one that was done with um, uh, the MCA technique. And then the graph on the right was done with the NEP technique or the negative extra pressure technique. The light blue line was a uh, baseline tracing. And then the dark blue line is the tracing that was done during the technique. So you see during exhalation here, there was a con consistent rise in um, tidal volume throughout the expiratory phase. So that means that there was no flow limitation on this patient. Same thing for the um, NIP technique, same thing for this, this, is, this. Both techniques were done on the same patient. You can see a consistent rise in tidal volume throughout the expiratory phase. Compare that to a patient who had flow limp, it was flow limited, you can see that during the expiratory phase, at some point, flow stops coming out. Um, and so even though they're, they're pressing on the abdomen throughout this expiratory phase, at some point, flow decreases to zero. Okay, so this patient had flow limitation. And, and you can see that for the negative expiratory pressure technique, it was pretty consistent. It looks pr practically the same. So demographics of the patients, um, again, they did 44 patients. Um, 13 of them were um, flow limited. 
I'm sorry, 13 were not flow limited, 31 were flow limited. Um, they, the ages of the patient, the flow limited patients were older. They were um, bigger, so they, had a, they were obese. They were smokers. They had COPD, asthma um, on the flow limited side. Um, as far as uh, tidal volumes, many volumes, pretty much the same. You had a higher tidal volume for the flow limited patients and it was common, the um, chronic lung patients, so it's not surprising. Um, the other thing that's not surprising is that there was significantly higher interest in PEEP with your flow-limited patients versus your not flow-limited patients. So looking at the data um, and a little a different view here as far as um, uh, tidal volumes and all those things, 13 patients had both techniques done, okay? So they didn't do this. Uh, they didn't do both techniques on all 44 patients. So these are the comparison of the patients who had both techniques done. The first six patients were not flow limited. Okay, so some things that stand out is, again, um, no significant intrinsic peak. Um, esophageal pressures were relatively low compared, except for this one patient that was 7.2. Um, so it's compared to the flow limited, which were the bottom, uh, the rest of the patients. So that they had significant uh, esophageal pressure uh, was higher. They all had MCA, I'm sorry, all had um, EFL, extra flow limitation. They all had significant intrinsic PEEP as compared to the non-flow limited patients. And something that was a little strange to me was that they actually, the, the vent settings for all the patients were pretty much the same, which, I mean, a rate of 24 on a patient who was flow limited, it seems a little extreme, even a, like a 1.7 second E time. Um, to me, you're pretty, I, I, I would imagine you are causing intrinsic peak and potential um, extra flow limitation on this patient by these vent settings. So I was a little baffled by that. Um, looking at the comparison of the two techniques to see if they, how they compare to each other, it, it was, they compare it very well, actually. Um, the first six patients who were not flow limited, both techniques show that they were not flow limited. And then the, the other seven patients um, that were flow limited, it showed both, both techniques techniques pretty much show that they were flow limited pretty consistently. So there wasn't one patient over here who had uh, one technique showing they were flow limited and one technique showing that they were not. So they were pretty consistent between the techniques. Also pretty consistent was in the face of intrinsic auto peep, they had significant um, flow limitation. So as auto peep goes up, flow limitation goes up. So to do an expiratory occlusion uh, or an auto peep measurement on the ventilator, and if there's no intrinsic auto peep, then more than likely they're not, they're not, they don't have expiratory flow limitation. So you can see that all these patients clustered here who had little to no intrinsic peep had no um, uh, expiratory flow limitation to speak of. So a good screening technique would be potentially to do uh, an intrinsic peep measurement prior to any, tech, any other techniques. So limitations of the study, small number of patients. Um, however, they did make a comment that there's not a lot of other studies that looked at this is not very large as well. Um, they commented on a lack of consistency as related to what the esophageal pressures that they were getting because they measured esophageal pressures as they pressed on the abdomen. Um, but the... Um, the measurements were pretty spot on as far as con comparing in the negative extraordinary pressure technique with the MCA technique. And they also, between investigators, they were getting the same numbers as they were doing the, doing the technique on the same patient. Uh, the ventilator settings I thought were a little strange, even though they made a comment about how you can mitigate extra flow limitation but they didn't seem to practice that as it related to what they set the patient up on. And I'm not, and, and there was no comment about 
we had to put them all in the same settings to make things, you know, consistent. I never saw a comment about that. So, so the ventilator settings were a little strange to me. So, so ways to mitigate extra flow limitation, basically it's, it's all about um, decreasing intrinsic auto peak, um, allowing the patient more time to exhale. And that means manipulate 90 ratio, uh, decreasing mini ventilation, less air in, less air has to come out. And also maybe the airways just need to have a little um, help um, being splinted open because of excessive uh, transpulmonary pressure. So adding some PEEP if the patient can tolerate it might be a, 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 something to look at. So in conclusion, the MCA technique seems to be, uh, seems to be pretty comparable to extratory flow to um, the negative extratory pressure technique to detect extratory flow limitation. So only thing you need is a ventilator and with a reliable pneumotac that measures proximally at the patient. So if your ventilator measures pressure volume and flows back inside the ventilator, then you're losing um, some measurement as far as um, reliability and as far as um, you know, accuracy. So here's an example of what it would look like on the G5 or Hamilton G5. And here's my flow volume loops. And right now I am pressing down right at the start of exhalation and keeping it pressed down throughout. And you can see even I had some time, I, it took me a few uh, tries to get it consistent. But here's a patient, if you can see that, has uh, no extra flow limitation throughout extra phase. There's consistent flow being um, pressed or the patient is having consistent flow coming out of their lungs throughout with this maneuver. So this is an example of a patient that does not have flow limitation. So let's, say, let's look at a patient who has flow limitation. So again, um, same technique. Uh, I'm sorry, same setup as far as your um, um, uh, flow volume loop. And you can see that as I press during exhalation at some point, I keep pressing and at some point the, the gas flow goes to zero. So there's no gas coming out of the patient. Um, there's no elevated, there's no consistency at some point, the airways collapse and there's no more gas coming out. So this is a patient who has, who has flow, flow limitation. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that presentation. Um, thanks for your attention and have a nice day.